right. I think we're good to go and and live. So all right. Hello, everybody, to all of our spirit coaches. My name's Liz Carey, alongside Brian Franca. We are your two cheer rules interpreters for the state of Colorado, and we are so excited to be with you guys today to walk through all of the fun cheer rules for the 2022-23 cheer season. We are going to go ahead and start with our presentation that we have. Um, you should have two items with you, which you may not have received both at this time. The first one is the 2022 Spirit Bulletin. That comes from the Chassa website. You can download that. Um, the second piece is the new Federation rulebook uh, that is here as well. Those should be arriving to your athletic director starting next week. So if you haven't gotten it yet, don't stress. We actually just got these today, um, but you can find all of the rule updates on the nfhs.com website uh, but you should be receiving that book starting next week Perfect. so we are going to go ahead and get started uh, and start walking through some rules all right All right, so the first thing that we always like to touch base on is why do we have safety guidelines in the first place? Obviously, it's for the athlete safety. We want to make sure that we always put the athlete safety first and foremost with anything that we do. In addition, progression of activity. You want to make sure that every season you are starting back at square one, you're always adding new team members on and it's best to review all of the basics before you start progressing into new and advanced skills. It's also for the safety of the athletes and for your protection as a coach as well to ensure that you've gone through all the proper progressions to keep yourself and the athlete safe. Next is for clarity and simplicity. Obviously, having all the safety guidelines, we want to take the brain power out of you having to try to think about rules and making sure that you understand how clear and how simple the rules truly can be for everybody's safety. And lastly, understand that there's always going to be a little bit of gray area in the rules that you do, but our whole mission is to try to minimize risk as possible to keep everybody safe. Okay, the next thing we're really gonna hone in on is this particular book. This is the Federation rule book. So a couple of things we just wanna be able to go through is how to read this Federation book. As you start flipping through the different pages, this is the order of the information that it comes to. First off, right when you open the book, it's gonna talk about the different rule changes. Then it's gonna go into the points of emphasis for the current season. Every year, the points of emphasis change based on what's going on in the industry and also feedback and seeing different rules and safety things that come about throughout the course of the year. So that's always a great section to make sure to read. The next piece is the rules committee. If you want to be able to find out who to go to, if you have any suggestions, uh, complaints, anything about how the rules are treating you and your team for the year, you're gonna wanna touch base with this group. Please know they are very hardworking people to make sure that they are doing everything in their power to keep all of us safe as can be. So they spend a lot of time to really make sure that they evaluate the rules every season. Next up, we go right into the philosophy of the NFHS, which we'll get to that here in just a little bit. Then it breaks down all of the definitions. We're gonna talk about how important knowing and understanding exactly what you and your athletes are doing and how it's defined. You can't determine the, the legality of a rule if you don't know how it's technically defined. Then it's gonna break down to the different sections of all of the cheerleading rules into the dance rules. And then the great thing at the very back of the book is it also has pictures of different examples for you to reference as well. All right, moving on how to read the Federation book. So the first thing is identifying the rules. This is just a simple example when you are looking through the book, how to identify how to read one of the rules. So the first thing, for example, if you look at rule 3.5.2b, the three stands for the area of the book. You can see that the number one stands for definitions. Number two stands for general risk management. Three stands for cheer and four stands for dance. So right now we know with rules starting with the number three, it's going to be for a cheer rules. The number five stands for which section in the book and number two stands for the article and the letter B talks about which specific letter within the article for that specific rule. How to interpret a rule. So for Brian and I, we want you to use the exact same process that we do whenever we're evaluating any skills at an event, or if you submit us videos, this is the exact same process that we follow. Step one is determine how you would define the skill that you're doing. That's where you go right to the definition section of the book and you determine exactly what skill you're doing. Is it an inversion? Is it a transition? Is it a tumbling or a dismount? How would you define that particular skill? After you identify how it's defined, then you wanna review the definition to ensure that the interpretation is correct of what you're doing. And step three is review the guidelines on legality for that particular skill. 
Don't forget to read the situations at the end of each section and look at the pictures in the back of the book to ensure that you are following the rule to a T. Perfect. All right, we'll talk about some of the new rule changes. We'll go a little bit more in depth when we get to each of those sections. But just to clarify, there are a few different definition changes. As you can see here, I'm not going to read it word for word for you, but basically we took out some words, or we, the Federation took out, and um, USA Chair took out some words um, to help easily define, help you easily understand what an airborne skill is. So you see they took out a few words to make that clarification. And then also you notice on head springs, um, again, adjusted the wording for that, a tumbling skill which a person places both hands and his or her head on the performance surface, pushes off with the hands while flipping legs over and landing on their feet. Again, just to clarify between a, a hand spring and a head spring, um, mostly you'll see that one in the dance side, but it's still there as well. Again, as you can see, the rationale for these is just making it um, explain a better uh, execution of these skills and help you to understand a little bit more. All right, another ones that came up were um, some hair adjustment um, things. And I know it's always gets tricky, like, oh, how's my hair? I know it's minor, but they took out a big line right there. The hair must be worn in a manner that's appropriate for the activity involved. While we still want that, they did move that away to make it more inclusive for um, different backgrounds and um, the rationale right there. Um, as long as it's securely affixed to hair and then, uh, sorry, affixed to the hair and then um, more just again being all inclusive you can see that in that last little paragraph there so we took that out still want you to be cautious safe with hair and how it's worn how it is but it left that out to make it more inclusive and for everybody um the other one that kind of came up in the articles was uh when we're talking about braces and casts and this one always comes up they did take out the support braces that have been altered from the fat the original design um, or uh, original design from the factory. Um, they just took that out, uh, obviously rationale there, um, interest of risk management, and then also um, knowing how do we know where, how it really came out of the factory. So um, we'll, if you ever have a question, we'll look at it, make sure it's safe, no hard edges or anything that, that shouldn't be there. But for the most part, um, if you do have an injury, you do have a brace, just make sure it's unaltered and obviously make sure it's safe and you know who's wearing it, what they're operating, what they're doing, just to, that extra bit of safety. All right, um, studying personnel uh, changes. So as you notice here, a base must not assume backband handstand position. We've, we've had that for a lot of times. Hold objects in their hand that are supporting the top person. Um, but the new one is a base and top person may share a palm during a mount or dismount from a thigh stand, shoulder sit, um, shoulder stand, or prep. So to make it simple, if you're new, just read it and know that this is a good for you. If you've been around for a while, this is very helpful to us because you can now build up or dismount with a palm hand to hand with the base um, from those levels. We've had to call this for many years and it's our least favorite thing to call and I know y'all hate it. We have to call it and now we love this because um, we don't have to. But for the most part, make sure you're still being safe, but you can now build and dismount uh, with a sharing a palm in the hand um, to those shoulder level skills and shoulder stands and or preps. I love this one as well. Um, part of the rationale why they did this, because I know several coaches with, that Brian and I talked to last year, a lot of you were adjusting your grips while building up to stunts mm -hmm. to where you started grabbing at the wrist so that you could still maintain your palms while you built up. Um, the NFHS did recognize that as not being the best technique, which was actually becoming more insafe than making it safer to do so. Um, so we we too are very excited about the change about allowing you guys to be able to use, keeping in mind it says share a palm, Correct. not a sign, but a palm to where you can share that while you're building up or building down in those specific stunts. So just make sure that you're very, very clear on exactly what props you're using and what stunts you're building to make that legal for you. And that's one that you're gonna see. So again, uh, the sign thing, make sure <laughs> you're aware. I, I already know it's gonna happen a few times this year. All right, brace flips. Um, another uh, nice little rule change there. Brace, brace flips in a pyramid are permitted providing the following conditions are met. You can see that the biggest thing that was taken out, both of the top person's hands or arms contain, maintain continuous contact with a bracer. Um, to make it simple, you can now be connected with just one arm, um, which is nice. 
Um, again, at least one arm connected to a bracer, have hand-to-hand -hand contact. And the biggest thing that you're going to see here in a second is that it has to be stationary. The bracer has to stay stationary. We'll see that in the next slide. But again, it allows for more sets of pyramids, more visuals, um, still follow the progression skills, still make sure you're being safe and all the good stuff, but there's a little more you can do with that um, for it. Um, as stated, uh, the biggest thing is that uh, right here, the bracers, they still need to be a, um, a double base uh, prep with a spotter. So three people underneath, and then they need to, be, need to maintain that, need to <laughs> remain stationary as they are doing that skill. Okay, so when they're flipping, they cannot be moving, can't, can't be transitioning, they need to be stationary. All right, good. All right, and then a couple of those small ones to clear up. Uh, they took out some simple wording there, switch up toss caught in a vertical stunt. Um, they took this out to allow for other positions. So you can see in that next sentence, a ball up position would not be considered um, um, basically against the significantly higher measurement. So basically again, currently switch ups are allowed and inverted releases to upright positions are allowed. Both could be considered harder than suggested the rule change. To make it simple, um, this allows you to do some more stuff. Okay. And you notice that last sentence on the very, very bottom also spinning switch ups are harder than, uh, um, than all skills that could be allowed with the changes. So just kind of pay attention to some of the smaller adjustments and smaller changes in there. But for the most part, just a simple word switch to allow for more. All right, um, a couple other small ones you can see. We have the big long definition, the three, uh, five, five C. Um, but the biggest thing is there right on their section little two there, um, they took out the with no more than a quarter turn. So that means you can do more than a quarter turn. All right. Um, again, please read through these. I'm not going through them word for word just to help you guys with time and watch them through the video, but you do want to make sure you read through these uh, new rule changes and understand them. If you have any questions, let us know. We'll look at some deeper things as we get deeper in the rules, but you can always reach out to us or um, send us videos as well. Okay, um, moving right along again in the book after you go through the definitions, the rule changes, the next part of the Federation that we always like to touch base on is the philosophy from the Federation. It's so making sure it's very similar to what Chassa, um, what their philosophy is as well. They do work very closely together and we just want to make sure that every coach is here for the right reasons and making sure that the time and effort you're putting in is actually contributing to the betterment of the athletes and for the overall sport and the community. So with the philosophy, again, just making sure that the number one priority of any spirit program should be to support the other athletic programs within your school. In addition, it's developing a culture of positive sportsmanship. Um, we know for years and years, cheerleaders and dancers haven't always had the best reputation. And I think over the past several years, certainly everybody has been doing all they can to try to improve, um, improve the overall reputation and have gaining a lot of respect for the sports that we do. Um, but continuing to grow that positive sportsmanship, not only amongst your athletes and your community, but to other teams as well. In addition, always trying to create a positive crowd involvement at any games or performances that you do. It is our job to make sure that we create a positive um, environment for spectators as well as for other guests and teams that are coming onto our school property. We always want to make sure that we center our focus on leading and directing the crowd in a positive manner. Next, we want to make sure that all of our athletes are always representing the school in a positive manner as well. Competition, while it is great to be a part of competition, um, or if your school chooses to participate in competition or does not, it should serve to develop the leadership and confidence and skills required of an athlete. In addition, it should come secondary to your role at your school and should not interfere with the primary responsibility that you do hold with supporting the other athletic programs. General risk management. Some other things to keep in mind as you're going through this, ensuring that athletes and coaches conform to all of the NFHS rules. It's great if you as a coach sit down and either go through with your athletes and your parents, the rules that are important, not only from the spirit bulletin, but also the federation. It just makes sure that everybody's on the same page and it helps protect you as well so that everybody knows what they can and what they can't do. And these rules are in place for you and to protect you as a coach as well. Even if you think that these rules are not what you like, like I think we could do something harder or something different. Remember that does fall back on you. Your schools and the Federation have said, these are the rules we follow. If you go outside these rules or someone gets injured, gets hurt because you were not following those rules, that does fall on you. And that's one, something we don't wanna do and we never wanna put our kids in, uh, in harm's way. 
Absolutely. Attitude is everything. Um, Brian and I are firm believers. It's always the attitude that a coach has. Um, as they say, a lot of times attitude reflects from the top down. So certainly however you go into your season and how you set the rules up, um, as long as you say, hey, these are the rules that we want to conform so it keeps your child safe and it keeps our program and the sport continuing to move forward, coaches and parents and kids are going to buy into that as well if you have a positive attitude going into the rules. Next thing, um, just for overall just general risk management, is making sure that you conduct an appropriate warm up prior to any activity. Um, this is just for the safety of the athletes to make sure. I know everybody gets super excited to come into practice and you want to start off maybe right where you ended your last practice or jump right into starting on a new sun or a pyramid or choreography, but you always want to make sure for the safety of the kiddos that you are giving them an appropriate warm up. Next, this just goes in with general fingernails, artificial nails. It just says that they have to be kept short. We get questions all the time. Can you have acrylic nails? Doesn't say anywhere that you can't have acrylic nails or dip or any other type of fake nails. However, we always just try to say, if you can put your hand up, we shouldn't be able to see any nails over the edge. They just need to be kept near the end of the fingers for safety. The new rule right here on the hair uh, devices, Brian already went through that. That's one of the new rules. Um, again, Definitely, they did take out the piece of wearing it appropriate for the activity, so they just want to make it more inclusive for everybody to make sure that it minimizes risk. Um, the last thing is, in addition to making sure that you have an appropriate warm up, you want to make sure that your practice sessions and surfaces are suitable for activity. Please ensure that wherever you are practicing um, for cheer or for dance is appropriate for what you're going to be doing. If you have mats, obviously, please use mats at as all times if you possibly can do. But be aware if you guys are practicing outside, if you are needing to be on concrete or hard surfaces, that you're modifying whatever skills you're working on during practice for that day to be suitable for that activity. Activity. Even if you hit it a hundred times out of a hundred times, if there's that one opportunity where it goes wrong, again, that does fall back onto you as a coach. And it's hard to watch a kid be in there crying, knowing that you could have prevented that. Absolutely. Okay, last couple things with general risk management. Um, just making sure that props that are made of hard material or have hard edges, tops may not release props to the ground. The person on the ground must gently toss or place the sign. Brian and I did unfortunately have to call this several times last year uh, at the state competition where there were top in stunts that were releasing their signs out of their stunt and dropping them straight to the ground as opposed to handing them off to an additional participant or handing them to a spotter that did not need to be there. Um, that's how you can discard of props if you are in stunts. Just make sure that you do that appropriately. And this is a very small rule that we hate calling because it's so preventable. So just go through your, as you're going through your routines and you start to see these things, just keep an eye out for some of these because it's the smallest rule that we have to call and it's, 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 it's preventable. Like so unfortunate. Yeah. Um, the next thing, obviously, just making sure that whenever you're practicing, competing, cheering at a game, you don't have any gum or candy. That's just for safety. Also, no stunting or tumbling while the ball, while the game ball is in play. That goes for everything. You want to make sure that the focus and the attention is on the sport that you're there supporting. And then being able to highlight any stunting and tumbling to get the crowd going during those key times of a game. Brian already touched base on support braces, casts, um, about the padding. If you ever need to wrap it, uh, however that is, just make sure you double check the rule book on what kind of a support brace it is. And again, it says, it's, uh, like I mentioned before, do not require additional padding, but just be cautious in what your, your athlete is doing and what position they are in the stunt just to, to make sure you're keeping extra safe. And again, wearing a plaster cast or a walking boot must not be involved in stunts, pyramids, tosses, jumps, or tumbling. So we always want to make sure if they do have a serious injury that's requiring them to be in a hard cast or a walking boot, we want to make sure that we give them the appropriate time to heal from that and not put them in any unsafe situations. Okay, last couple things. Um, if you ever have a situation where if somebody is bleeding, if they have blood on their uniform, please have them leave the activity until they are appropriately clean. This isn't just for their safety, but also for cross contamination, anything we just want to make sure and the crowd certainly we want to put our athletes in the best light out there. Um, anybody exhibiting signs or symptoms or behaviors of concussion or of, of a concussion shall be removed until cleared by a professional. Um, please, please, please take this one extremely serious. Not that everything else is not important, but certainly everybody can take a hit to the head but listen to how your athletes are feeling based on the signs and symptoms and I know everybody's required to do the concussion mm -hmm. training but please really listen to those have an athlete sit out from practice inform their parents right away and get them cleared by a professional before they return 
Uh, the last little bit here is head coverings worn for religious reasons, um, just not to expose one's uncovered head may be worn, but must be secure um, and not made of any non-abrasive material. So, or not made of any abrasive material that could cause a safety issue. Perfect. All right, I'll talk a little about sportsmanship. Again, we go into a lot of great things about the rules, the rule book, um, philosophies, but also sportsmanship. This is comes down to some of you coaches and helping teach your athletes. Um, again, like it says in there, we are responsible for sportsmanship, coaches, athletes, parents, judges, spectators. And like Liz had mentioned before, it kind of does start with the top down and uh, uh, it reflects on you. So the more of a better sport you are, the more you can teach your kids to do the right things, um, they'll learn that and pick that up to you since they look up to you. Um, so again, are we teaching and modeling behavior we want from our athletes? If we're cutting corners, uh, breaking rules, all that, we're kind of promoting it's okay. If we're overly upset, uh, talk a lot of trash about a ref, another team, anything else, gossip about those people, our kids are going to see that and think that's okay and that's what we're supposed to do. So make sure you're modeling that good behavior. You are a role model. Um, you are an icon now for them. So make sure you're following that. Um, cheerleaders and dancers are selected for athletic ability, traits, potential, leadership, representative of all your program and community, community. And like I said, cheerleader, the leader part means something. So make sure that you know we're using this, this opportunity to not just perform, not just show off what our skills are, but helping them be a bigger part of the community, represent the school. Again, they are representatives. And so we want to make sure that we're helping them with that and providing them those opportunities. Um, and again, helping them grow as people. And then help create and maintain positive atmosphere while teaching, respect, etiquette. Um, it's what makes spirit unique. Again, it's not just about cheering there. There's a lot of the things you're a role model, an ambassador. Um, you get invited to go to different things, like maybe there's a new uh, grocery store opening, or maybe you're going to the little elementary school. It's not always the football team or the swim team or anything like that. It's you because you guys are supposed to represent uh, some of the best of what your school has to offer. Um, so make sure you have that. Make sure you pass that along. I know that's why Liz and I are still in this sport and why we're, we loved it. It's because of the things it did for us. I mean, I got into it as a joke and I love what it's done and the opportunities it's provided because you got to be um, more than just someone who's, who throws some really cool skills. So um, teach that and pass that on. All right, some other ways to keep um, the sportsmanship going and some uh, great tips and things you should probably want to look at doing. Um, when you have a visiting team coming in, you're greeting them, you're polite to them, you're welcoming them, especially when it's rivals. I know that it gets all fired up and like, we hate them, but you, why? If that's a rival from 50 years ago, it doesn't mean you have to be rude to them. You know, it might have just, you know, be polite, um, start to meet people, but uh, let that visiting team know. And I always joke with this, it's, it's hard to to be mad at a team when they're nice to you. Um, it's hard to, to be like, oh man, we're gonna beat them. It's hard to beat them like, oh, they're so nice. You know, or talk to us. So make sure you're welcoming people and just be polite and it, it comes back around. Uh, make sure you're always cheering on your own team. This is huge for your crowds. I know it's fun for the crowd to get some um, chants going and inappropriateness or, or call that out, but use your cheer team to counteract that and make sure you're cheering for your own team. Um, avoid cheer offs and tumble offs. Just, just have some, some some tact to it. Um, try to work together or kind of, uh, you know, chat with another coach and say, hey, I want to do this together. We're on each other's other side. Let's do something. But try to make it always positive. Again, attitude reflects leadership and that's going to be coming from you. Um, and then again, raising activities, crowd engagement, amazing type of stuff. Make sure you're getting involved. You don't, cheerleading has a special place because it's part of the school and it's an athletic activity. So make sure you always have that. You're not just turned into just an athletic activity and that you're not involved with, with um, you know, half times or homecomings or events. Make sure you're always involved in getting that, that uh, leadership side of it. And then discourage the bad behaviors. Um, don't promote bad sportsmanship. If your crowd's doing something, teach your kids to do better. Um, as a coach, take the fall. Say, tell them I made you do it. But you know, have your kids, train them to, to help uh, prevent that. That's what your school's looking for as well and your administration will really appreciate. And then the biggest thing, that last one, you're preparing them to be great leaders. Um, all you veteran coaches know you have some amazing kids that you've helped influence over the years and to do great things. And we wanna make sure that we're doing that to all of them. All right, a couple of things about uh, apparel and accessories. Again, just remember no jewelry, except for religious or medical alert bracelets taped down. If you come to competition and you have one of those concerns, let us know, we'll make sure you're good. But piercings have to be removed, dermal piercings. All that has to be removed, um, they are illegal. Um, 
the dermal ones, if you notice there, make sure anything is removed that can be removed. And we've been doing this for years. So you can see the gray hairs here. I don't know, but we've seen pretty much everything. So even if you think your or your trailer thinks they have it hidden, you'll be surprised where it pops up there or a spotter sees it and he's like, and he looks at you and, and then you look and you can notice it as well. Those things pop out. So um, just be aware of it. It's the worst thing. And if you haven't seen it, you're lucky. When one of those gets ripped out, um, it's not pretty. So make sure we're following those rules. This is not a new rule. It's before my time. So um, <laughs> we, uh, we, every year we always get questions from coaches about mm -hmm. kids that just got their ears pierced. Unfortunately, the start of a new season is not the best time to get your ears pierced. Unfortunately, as it does say, post earrings covered by tape, navel rings, um, plugs, spacers, even hair ties on the wrist are considered, that is all considered jewelry and is an infraction to what the rule requires. You will get a deduction if any of those um, are taking place at a competition, but it's not just at competition. These things need to be happening during your practices, mm -hmm. at your games, everything. Again, the rule is put in place for the safety of the athletes. And that's a hard part too and that's where kids tend to get hurt is because they forget because at practice you could do it and i know you don't want to be the bad guy but it, it will happen and it's, it's not a pretty sight yeah. <laughs> um in full costume mascots may not uh stunt or tumble except forward rolls or cartwheels this is just important if you have any mascots i know it sounds kind of funny or if you have an amazing mascot who can do that wow but either way keep them safe um a lot of people don't know what those suits are made out of it's just there's a safety issue there um if you have any questions you can let us know and then uniform uh cover midriff again i know what you see on tv movies uh all-star world all that stuff but this is still high school you have dress codes in high school um that you should be following and and what your school says so it doesn't change just because you're a cheerleader so make sure your midriffs are covered at games and events and then um again it's just how it is and it's, it's it's just appropriate thing there so so be aware of that that one kind of comes up here and there even at practices that's for you and your school to work out but remember you do have dress codes so that's usually what your athletic director likes to look at and then glitter make sure it adheres to the body um and it's not loose loose glitter is terrible being a, a former uh you know co-ed cheerleader and i'm looking up and stuff falling in your eyes is not good um and it gets everywhere so make sure for safety reasons that that's laminated put down on props anything else like that if it's going to come off um try to avoid that um as well cool sign cool. personnel yeah. All right. Okay. So for stunting personnel, so now we're going to kind of start diving in really heavily into the actual stunting piece of it. Again, we're not going to read every word that's on here. Um, most of this is all taken verbatim from the Federation rule book. So please walk through every section when you have time and really make sure that you're reading and understanding the rules. Um, but we certainly want to hit the high notes to do what we can to keep everybody safe. So as Brian mentioned to this before, a base must not be in a back bend be in a headstand, be in a handstand. Um, they must not hold objects in the hand that's supporting a top person. And then we already touched on what this exception means, holding a palm. Again, we underline the word palm, not sign. So you may share a palm when you're building up and when you're dismounting, but only from these specific stunts, a thigh stand, shoulders, shoulder sit or straddle, a shoulder stand or a prep. Other stunting personnel. So again, if you are doing any extended stunts, the bases must have both feet in direct weight bearing contact with the performance surface and the bracer must not provide primary support. The pictures listed here, what you can see on the left hand side where it says illegal is you can see that top person that is doing the hitch onto her bracer, she is leaning on. And if that bracer weren't there, she would fall over onto the ground and not be safe anymore. Um, the one on on the right hand side, you can see that if that middle bracer was not there, it appears that both of those stunts on either side could certainly still hold those stunts up without that middle person. That's what we're looking for. And again, it's all for safety. And if you're seeing this, that's why we they hired you is to help coach to make it the correct way. Safe. Um, moving on, stunts that require a spotter, a very easy way to immediately think about should this stunt have a spotter is basically any times your, your arms are raised above your head, immediately assume you're probably going to need a spotter. There are a few exceptions which we'll touch base on and that are noted in the book, but if 
a stunt requires a spotter, the spotter must be in the proper location with an appropriate body position to help minimize risk. In addition, they must be visually focused on the head, neck, and shoulders of the top person. A lot of times we see, and we see this a lot in single base stunts, they have a spotter that's there, but the spotter is not looking up at the stunt, or as you can see, looking at the far left photo, there's a spotter, but they're about a mile away from the stunt. So if that top person were to start to come down, they are not in a position to catch or be in a position to minimize risk. So in order to make that stunt legal, we would just need to move that spotter that's standing so far away, move it close right next to the stunt. So physically, if you're a spotter, you should be able to put your hands and uh, catch that stunt if it were to fall. The next picture, the second picture from the left, um, what that is showing is that is showing where the spotter um, to where it can be either at the wrists of the bases or the spotter behind that extended stunt is still visually focused on the top person's head, neck and shoulders. Doesn't mean they have to touch, they're in a position to catch. On the next part, that's where it says that it's illegal because you can see that the back spot in this extended stunt is holding palms. Um, because it's an extended stunt, that spotter does need to be in a position uh, to spot and be visually focused and not holding any props in their hands. Um, in addition, you'll also see where the top person is passing and handing a sign or a prop down. The reason why that is also illegal is because that extended stunt does require a spotter. If it requires a spotter, that spotter cannot take the prop from the top person because then that required spotter is holding a prop and they cannot effectively spot that stunt. On the far right hand side, it is showing that it's or that it's legal because they are at shoulder level or prep level. At that point, that particular stunt does not require a spotter. And that's why that top person can actually hand palms or assign to their spotter at that time because they're not in an extended position. And again, we call these ones more frequently than we'd like to. The main thing is here, most of the time you had a spotter, you were ready to go, but you're just not doing the right thing. So these are 100% preventable and simple, uh, simple things we can fix. So we hate calling these ones as well. So double check, just make sure, talk to your spotter. And, and again, think of it for safety reasons. Uh, if you're sitting there going, well, I don't want that girl too close because it throws off the visual. Um, again, that's not what the judges are looking at of how far away that girl was and that's gonna take off points. Um, we're looking to make sure you're safe. Okay, moving on. This talks about, uh, again, stunting with props. A base must not hold objects in the hand, which we've already hit on, um, must not hold objects when supporting in an extended stunt. We just talked about that as well. But a base may take a prop from a top person while supporting them in a prep, a shoulder straddle, and actually what we can add on to here as well is a thigh stand um, or a shoulder stand as well now. Continuing to move on, talking about the grips of the top person. So there's key places that if you are going to have your spotter hold on to the stunt, you wanna make sure that they are holding on either at the wrists, they can hold on to the ankles, they can be reaching up onto the forearms of the bases, where they cannot be is directly under the feet. And that's why that picture on the left is illegal because the spotter is going underneath the foot. As soon as they go specifically under the foot and are holding the exact same place that a base does, they become a base, they no longer become a spotter. So please make sure that you are holding in the correct spot. You can also see in the far right picture, they also have their arms up. You don't have to have your spotter standing there with their arms up. As long as they are there in a position visually focused to spot and minimize risk, you're fine. Another way we used to look at it or used to call it was weight bearing. If your uh, back spot is bearing the weight of the skill, not lifting or assisting it, then that's kind of where we notice it. Okay, continuing on. So now for single base stunts. Uh, the first picture on the left hand side, the reason why this is legal is because really this is just a different type of prep level stunt. It's a single base prep level stunt. So remember in a single base prep level stunt, you're not required to have a spotter. That's why the other um, technically spotter on the side can be underneath the feet because it's staying at shoulder level. Now, if that stunt were to press to an extension, that spotter cannot stay under the foot. They would need to switch to either the wrist, the ankles, or into just a visually focused position for that stunt to be legal if they were to go to extension. You can also see on the right hand side where the spotter is just standing there to give a true single base type visual. That is perfectly fine as well. Their arms do not need to be up showing that they're spotting as long as you are close to the stunt in a position to spot and looking at the stunt, you're good to go. 
Okay, this is just where anytime again, always default, whenever the base's arms are extended, you're probably gonna need a spotter. These are just a couple extend or a couple exceptions to that rule where if you look at it, the base's arm might be extended. I love the far left, it's a chair sit, but her arm's extended, but technically that is not a high risk stunt, which is why they don't have um, a spotter required. Again, you can look across some of these other ones. These are funny pictures, <laughs> we love them. They haven't updated retro. these in a while. <laughs> <laughs> We're going in the way back machine here, but um, but these are just some pictures and you can always look in the book too, just to see if they have any other ones there, but always just assume if the arms are extended, you're probably nine out of 10 times going to need a spotter. Okay. All right. Well, I probably should have taken over on some <laughs> of those lists. I know you're going to talk about inversions. You still good to take those? Or? Yeah, you can start and then I'll start. All right, right I'll in. take a few of them. I'll give Liz a little bit of a break. So again, make sure you're looking at inversions. The definition of inverted is shoulders below waist. An inverted top person may not pass through an extended position. Um, uh, sorry, they may pass through an extended position, but must not begin and or pause or stop in an extended inverted position. Just think common sense safety. Um, if we're extended and upside down, there's a lot that can happen if you come straight down on your head. So that's why we have those different levels. Um, we again, do have a video uh, yep, we if we want to show that one. I'll let Liz run that. Kick that over here. Yeah, right there. Yep. Oh, the pancake one. I apologize. We'll go back. Let's just click. We'll on. grab it. All right, as we're pulling up for the bigger version of it, again, we just pull these straight from USH here. So again, skills can pass through extended, but cannot stop an extended. And this video, the reason why it is illegal, and we're just gonna show it just a couple times, is so that you can see, you can notice at the top when the top person pauses and then drops down into the inverted position. If it were to be a continuous motion as they go up and she immediately, um, uh, drops her head down below her waist, it would be legal. However, in this particular video, she has a slight pause there and then goes over. That's what makes it illegal. There is a very fine line between that. So make sure mm -hmm. when you're doing this particular stunt that you are following the correct rules. And that's why I said we can pass through, but we can never stop. Again, if she were to that stop and something was to go wrong, you're coming straight down on your head. And again, we have problems and got to make some phone calls. <laughs> Don't want to do that. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll go through a couple more here for you. Uh, brace inversions. There's a couple different types of uh, inversions, brace rolls, and flips. We want to make sure we totally understand the difference between. A brace inversion is a brace top person is in an inverted position. Okay. Again, shoulders um, below the waist. So again, a brace inversion, we're braced with someone on the ground. Okay. So that could be we're holding on to someone, but either way, Braced. And they don't have to be on the ground. A brace inversion can also be braced with a brace correct, correct, in, correct, the, correct. in the stunt as well. Yes. So depending on what skill we're doing, if we're doing something, a pyramid or whatnot, they have to just be braced. Um, for a braced roll, a top person, um, a braced top person performs hip overhead rotation while in contact with a person on the performance surface. So again, the difference between the braced inversion and a uh, a brace roll is again, we're going hip overhead rotation. So we're not just inverted, which is a brace inversion. We start upside down pretty much. Um, this one, you're going head over heels, but again, um, we're connected to someone on the performance surface. A braced flip, and this is where some of our new rules come, changes come in. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. A braced flip, a top person performs hip overhead rotation while released from all persons on the performance surface. Usually they obviously have to be maintained braced with a person at prep level. Great. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about brace inversions that do not flip or roll. So again, picture this as somebody, they're not flipping, they're not doing any rolling, but as Brian said, they aren't in an inverted position, meaning shoulders below their waist. Um, what you want to make sure that you have is at least two bases um, or a base and a spotter when you're performing this skill. In addition, the top person and at least one bracer maintain contact. Last year, there was a rule change. In the past, a lot of for the inversions, you had to maintain hand to arm contact. Now, starting last year, it actually changed to where you no longer have to be hand to arm contact, you just have to maintain contact. And we're going to show you a couple of examples to where you can be maintaining contact on the waist, on a foot, as long as there's contact between the inverted top person and a bracer, you're fine. And again, the key is the braced inversions. 
um, for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, a couple other things. If you are going to be getting released from this inversion, you want to make sure that whatever you're doing before and after is legal. You also want to make sure that each bracer is at prep level or below. Again, for these particular inversions, you only need two bases or a base and a spotter for the bracer. Bracers cannot provide primary support. Um, and then the top and the base make no more than a quarter turn around as they're doing their continuous movement. If you go to new catchers, they must be in place when that transition initiates. We saw a lot of creative transitions last year, but a lot of times the bases were involved in something right before they were catching somebody in a new transition. They have to be in place when that transition starts. In addition, you're never able to land an inverted position and that's just for safety reasons. So we're going to show you a couple of examples of these. Here is an inversion where they started an inverted position and you can see the bracer is maintaining contact with the foot. So it doesn't have to be hand to arm, it's right on the foot and the leg and they never let go with their bracer. So that is a legal stunt. Okay, the next one that we wanna show here is another type of, let's see here, there we go. Oh, excuse me. There you go. And here's another one. So you're in an inverted position. You can see that bracer is holding onto the waist. They do their little release and they transition up into that legal stun. As long as that bracer is maintaining contact, you have all the right number of people on the bottom. This is a legal stunt. Perfect. So we're going to go ahead and close those out. All right. And we're going to keep on rolling. Okay. Moving on here. Next thing we're going to talk about is braced inversions. Just continuing to review these. This is the pictures from the book as well. Um, you will see, as we've talked about, two bases or a spotter uh, is needed for a bracer on inversions that do not flip or roll. That's what the pictures on the left show, is that on the far left, you can see that the bracer, in this particular photo, they are grabbing hand to arm, which is fine, but you can see that there are two bases under that bracer, but there's no back spot, and that is okay, and that is legal. Um, same picture on the right. All of these are good. As a reminder, the connection no longer has to be hand to arm, just maintain contact. Okay, braced rolls in the pyramid. As Brian talked about, a roll is considered when you do hip overhead rotation, but you always maintain contact with somebody on the performance surface. So this is where the inverted top person should have at least two bases or a base and a spotter. And if you're bracing the same thing, two bases or a base and a spotter. Here's an example of a braced roll. Now with this particular one, they grab hand with the back spot, but they always maintain contact with that spotter on the ground. Even if they connect the foot with the bracer, you can see the right hand of the top person is holding hands with the spotter on the ground. That is considered a braced roll. Okay, braced flips in a pyramid. So now in the flips, this again is where your top person becomes completely released from their bases, but they are maintaining contact now, um, starting actually, I think last year or the year before was where you only needed one bracer. Now the new fun change for this year is rather than having to be connected with both hands to your bracer, now you only need to be connected with one hand um, at one time, but it does have to be hand to hand, hand to arm contact now that you're going to one hand. That's the biggest change for this year. We're excited to see how creative everybody gets with their new pyramid transitions. Right. So we look forward to doing that, but just ensure that you still have the same number of people. So you still will need eight people to perform this. It doesn't change that you still need eight people to perform a flip. It just means now they don't have to maintain contact on both hands. In addition, three people must be involved in the toss and the catch. If it ends in a cradle, you can, if you're a bracer, let go after they flip and they're going, they're no longer inverted. You can slowly start to let go so it doesn't pull you down if you need to do that. Just be very cautious before you let go. And again, those bracers do need to be in that double base prep with the spotter. Absolutely. And Brian really just hit on this as well. Multi-base preps. We have called this a few times at state as well, or even at league events um, where we see shoulder stands that are bracing this, especially if you have a smaller school and you're trying to get a big visual, double check your numbers that you are doing it correct and legal. Um, the biggest change again is making sure that you know that you remain stationary. Those bases are not able to move while the flip is going on. Um, they also must be to the side or to the front of the bracers. Um, it can end, it must end in a non-inverted 
inverted position. The top does not perform more than one and a quarter flipping rotations and no more than one complete twist. Um, the release top and bases make no more than a quarter turn around those bracers. And if the catchers are not the original bases, please make sure that they're in place prior to that flip happening. And again, if you have any concerns, we'll let you know how to send us videos, um, but definitely make sure there's a lot we're throwing at you with these brace flips. So if it's something new or something you're not sure of, let us know. Absolutely. And here's just a quick visual of what a brace flip looks like. Not that one. Oops. We'll go right back to control. So you can see we've got two stunts. This can come from any spot. You have eight people that are doing it. They go over, they do an inversion where they maintain. Now, keep in mind for this year, in this particular video, you maintain contact with both hands, but this year you only need to be in contact with one hand. And again, even though we can do one hand, make sure you're still being safe if your team's not ready, stick with the two or just work your way up progressions. Absolutely. And then all other inversions. So inversions may release to the following, provided the release goes to the original base and there is a spotter. So non-inverted dismounts with no more than a half turn. They can also go to a load position with no more than a half turn, or they can go up to any level that you want with no more than a quarter turn. So now here is, let's see here, the next video that we've got showing you to a couple different positions. Nice little simple inversion to cradle. This is a great one to start with, especially if you're starting to teach and build confidence. That's one of them. And then this is another type of inversion. So here the inversion, they're going down from the ground on that back handspring up to the very top. Different types of inversions that are not specifically in a pyramid type setting or with a bracer. Okay, talking about other just inversions, a real easy way without reading through all of these. Think about the closer you are to the ground, the less number of spotter, or I guess the less number of contact that you need. So when inversions begin um, and remain below shoulder level or prep level, only one person needs to maintain contact with that top person until they're no longer inverted. As you start going up, you'll see right here, as it starts to hit prep level and starting to go through prep level, you need two people to be in a position to protect that top person. Next, inversions, again, you just want to continue as they pass through that prep level. You must have contact that can be sufficient to stabilize and control that top person. They cannot go into an inverted position down to the performance surface um, from prep level or higher. And if they're caught by a cradle or by other bases, they just have to be in, uh, be in their spot before that initiates. All right, inversions and props. Um, again, inverted, inverted per people should not um, hold any props. That just kind of makes some simple sense. Uh, they're upside down. They want to make sure their hands are available um, or they're able to hold on to who they need to. So um, the only exception is that during transitions from inverted uh, positions on the performance surface to a non-inverted stunt. So if they go from the performance surface up, again, they're going inverted up, up straight, a little bit more safer there. And then also from a prone position be um, below prep level, um, usually into a forward roll dismount. So those are two safe ones you could do, but for the most part, we wanna to try to avoid that. Um, all right, let's talk about some non-release stunts real fast. Just a, a couple things to go through. We'll kind of, uh, kind of progress these a little bit more quicker just because these have been around for a while. And again, they're easy to read in there. In pyramids where one stunt is or where one extended stunt braces another extended stunts, the connection must not be hand to arm to foot. Okay. So basically if your extended stunts are connected, it must be hand to hand. Okay. Or hand to arm. You cannot go extended and having one person hold on to the foot. 
Um, in addition, you can move up and down from prep level to extended to libs. I know way back, so if you've been at Trillion for a while, this was an issue of when you could go up, how far you can go up and, and all that good stuff. It's simple. Extended stunts can be connected, except it has to be hand to arm or hand to hand, can't be holding the foot. Um, they may be moved from a vertical position, vertical, ah, tough one there. That's a tough vertical. one. Vertical. Vertical position. <laughs> from vertical position to a horizontal position, provided the following. So again, if you're going vertical, dropping the horizontal, top maintains contact with at least one original base post or spotter. Um, secondly, a two catchers and a, or a base catch the upper body. If the catchers are not the original, they remain close and are in place. And if catchers are not the original, top begins or passes through extended over position, three catchers are in place. The biggest thing I see or we see in this a lot is that first one, top maintains contact with at least one original uh, base or spotter. Um, again, you're going from vertical to a horizontal position. Again, this isn't a cradle. Um, this is, again, going prone or going straight back, you have to maintain contact. I see a couple times a year people saw something they saw on an all-star or college and they throw them up full release and catch them. Again, cannot do that. Um, so make sure you're paying attention to these rules. Um, release stunts to tosses. For the most part, we've had a lot of adjustments in the wording to make a lot of these things more clear and simple. But for the most part, top directed is directed vertically and caught by the original basis. So we're going straight up. And again, caught by the original bases, not landing inverted. Again, think about the momentum coming down forcefully with your head going towards the ground is not good. And you cannot pass under, over, or uh, sometimes through a participant or a prop. Again, we've, these have been around for a while, but you never know um, what can come up there. So just make sure you're not going over, under, or through somebody. Tosses and catchers remain in the original location unless it's a safety move. So again, if they're throwing, they're staying right where they're at unless it's to adjust for safety reasons. And again, top person makes no more than one and a quarter turn during the release, okay? And then the biggest in that new one, a toss must not go significantly higher than the skill, the intended skill. So a ball up position would not be considered against this um, because it's significantly not higher with the measurement of it. So again, if I'm tossing someone up, it's controlled, it's appropriate for the skill. If we're trying to throw it as high as can be and it's beyond you know, grasp of all of our bases and it's out of control, it's unsafe, that's a problem. When it talks about that ball up, again, if we're throwing the person the appropriate level, they happen to pull their knees up and then bring them back down, again, that's not considered out of control. It's uh, the correct height. And then tosses, this is, uh, most people think, again, basket tosses is the normal name that you refer to. But there's a couple key rules, especially when you're coming into football season, um, only on grass, real or artificial, um, just make sure it's there. Uh, they do have some give to it or a mat or a rubberized surface, okay? Now we say mat or rubberized surface, uh, mats are pretty self-explanatory, but um, some people ask about the track. If it's a rubberized track that has give, that is awesome. If it's a rubber coating on top of cement, not, not to say. Okay, so make sure you're being aware of it. Again, think of it as a coach. Like if I hit this hard, am I gonna die? Then don't do it, <laughs> okay? If you're sitting there going, okay, this, this has some give, this, this, this is squishiness, that's good. So just be aware of that. Um, make sure the mat or the rubberized, not rubber co covered surface. Um, we see a lot more of the, some of the gyms or middle schools or even some of the high schools and some of their, think of your weight rooms. When you see that little rubberized floor and a lot of those weight rooms, that's just concrete with a little piece of uh, some rubber coating. So be very cautious. Um, no more than four people. We do run into this calling it sometimes. You have that extra person you're trying to hide. Like, go stand behind the basket toss. If they're close in the spotter range, they're considered part of the stunt. So make sure it's only four people. Make sure that that's good. And then one tosser is behind the top person throughout the toss. And that's key because, again, we're protecting the head, neck, and shoulders. So make sure that one person is um, behind the toss or in the right position. Cradle by at least two of the original tossers and separate head and uh, shoulders spotter, um, who was the original. So um, again, don't think full out basket toss on these, but some of our other tosses, uh, just make sure we have the right people in the right position. The spotter is uh, the original tosser. And the top person cannot hold objects in the hands. Again, signs, palms, et cetera. This is key because I know we're thinking, well, in stunts, the top person can hold a sign or they can hold a palm. But we are tossing, we are fully releasing them. So we wanna make sure that they uh, are not holding any objects or throwing them off. All right, again, a couple other things that we kind of mentioned before, a switch up um, was mentioned in some of the wording and taken out, um, but a switch up to one or both feet and caught by the original bases, um, legal transition, and then release uh, transitions are permitted providing the following, 
um, conditions are met throughout the transition. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, regulations here to make sure you're aware of this. So then these are legal as long as a skill before and after the lease are permitted. You've heard that before at other skills. Each bracery is at prep level or below, again, for safety reasons. If, um, if in a prep or shoulder stand, bracers shall have two bases or a base and a spotter. So a couple of little things in there. And then a top person um, and at least one bracer maintain contact except for, again, a couple non-brace top um, persons in vertical positions. Again, we're not gonna go through all these full in depth, but again, make sure that you're paying attention to um, that non-brace the top person in the vertical position at prep level or above may be released to the original bases. Um, and then again, notice that they may not take more than a quarter turn. And then the next one on there, non-braced uh, top in a cradle position, horizontal position at top at prep level or below may, not, may be released to the original bases and loading position or stunt at any level. Notice that we, that is another change there. They took out that with uh, that quarter turn. We mentioned it before, but here's more of the detail in there. Okay, and quickly D, E, and F. Uh, bracers do not provide, uh, provide primary support for the top person um, and remain stationary. We, we've kind of gone through that for other rules, but now you can see this comes into play. And then top person makes no more than a quarter turn around the braces. This is important to know because uh, a lot of pyramids, there are certain ones where it has to make a quarter turn um, when it's holding onto a bracer. They do a quarter turn around that bracer. It has to show a clear, distinct stop. We do kind of see this and kind of have to call these sometimes if it's a, a continuous where they do a quarter turn and they keep going or it's more than a quarter turn. There's some safety issues involved in that. So make sure you're paying attention to anything where it's uh, releasing around the bracer it has to be a quarter turn. Any questions, definitely send in a video. And then if they're not the original catchers, if the catchers are remain in place. And again, you heard that a lot in the um, inversion side as well. All right, talking about suspended stunts. Um, so with suspended stunts, uh, I always, we're gonna show you some pictures of some different splits and visuals like that, but it's really important to make sure that if any suspended splits are non-braced, if they're not braced, um, so these are just suspended splits that begin below prep level must have two bases and a top person must have both hands in contact with at least one base or a post. Um, if you are doing non-braced suspended splits that begin or pass through prep, prep level or above, you need to make sure that you have at least three bases that can slow the momentum of the top person. The top person has both hands in contact with the bases once they reach that full split position. Um, but the exception is, is they may let go of one hand hand um, once they get into that position to adjust uh, their positioning with their post. At least two of the bases need to make sure that they are supporting under the top person's legs. And that third base may also support under the legs um, or be in contact with the top person's hands. So here's some pictures of that to where it's showing you specifically as to where those grips are. The ones across the top, what you can see in the second to right is where she's letting go to readjust her grip, but she is maintaining contact with both hands in that split position. And these have been here for a while, so you can tell that there's obvious concerns with safety and uh, going beyond it. It's just step. ensuring, especially with the hip rotation, right. if that other spotter wasn't there or the other base wasn't there to help support the weight, they could roll off the front um, because that is the direction of where their hips are. That's Correct. why they ask for that and maintain the hand contact. Talking about a swing stunt. So with this one, we, we've seen this quite a bit actually over the years, especially with people getting creative with their transitions. Just make sure if you are wanting to do that, um, that if you are doing any downward move and it begins below prep level, um, the top person always remains face up and the top person begins on the performance surface or in a stunt that is below prep level. So unfortunately, while it may look really cool, you're not able to start all the way up in a prep position and then swing and drop down and swing back up again. So that type of swing stunt Again, you do need to be in a downward movement and it has to come from below prep level while you're doing that. And face up, no and face, face down. up. Your, your top girls don't want to have beaten the blue mat. <laughs> Okay, moving on to dismounts. We're doing really good. So with these, both bases and catchers um, must not move except for safety purposes. Brian already hit on that when we talked about tosses. Um, you don't want to have any dismounts that are moving on purpose. So for safety reasons. Um, dismounts to the performance surface from prep level or above do need the assistance from a base or spotter to help slow the momentum of the top person. And if that dismount involves a certain skill, a toe touch, a twist, they, it does require two bases or a base and a spotter so that way they can really slow down the momentum of the top person as they come to that performance surface. 
If you are cradling, make sure that you always remain vis visually focused on that top person. If you're cradling, no props made of hard materials or sharp edges. So you cannot cradle with a sign if it is made of a hard material. Yes, you can cradle with palms. Those are not considered hard materials, so you can cradle with palms. In addition with cradles, no more than one and a quarter rotations are allowed. Bases can make up to a quarter turn. Um, otherwise, they can only move for safety purposes. So when you are maybe doing a one and a quarter down for a dismount, that is where the bases would make that extra turn for safety purposes so they can catch the top person correctly. Cradles from multi-base stunts must have two catchers and a spotter. Cradles from single base stunts do require an additional head and shoulder spotter. So as a reminder, when you're catching that, you can have the base, the top person, but then you do need that extra head and shoulders person to catch on the cradle. For tumbling. So tumbling or rebounding over a stunt person prop is not allowed, except for non-airborne tumbling skills over a person or prop on the performance surface. Tumbling with signs or palms, you are able to do uh, forward rolls and backward rolls with signs and palms. You can also now do other airborne skills where the hands don't actually touch the floor, which would be standing tucks. That's with palms only. Standing tucks or aerials are allowed with palms. And the last part of tumbling here, as a reminder, dive rolls are not permitted. So make sure if your choreographer is putting that in that it does not meet the definition of what a dive roll is. In addition, flips cannot land in partner stunts or in a cradle. They must finish the pass on the performance surface. Then you can go into a stunt or cradle position. Um, you are allowed in tumbling up to one, rota one rotation allowed, so a full twist. And then twisting skills are only allowed on grass or mat or rubberized track. He already talked about those different surfaces, but please do not have your athletes throwing uh, twisting skills on a gym floor. And that's very important. We see it a lot of times, especially at basketball and volleyball. Um, even if your kid can do it, again, it falls on you if they get hurt. Doesn't matter if they want to throw it, you should have been the coach to know that. Also, one thing to point out, we get this a question a lot. This is it for tumbling. Um, if you're coming from the all-star world, we get a lot of questions. Well, do they have to stop, pause, take a step, anything like that? No, this is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. No more than one twisting rotation. And um, yeah, that's about it. That's great. Okay, drops. Um, I'll take drops from here. Um, drops that go directly to thighs, splits, knees, or seat on the performance surface are not permitted unless weight is borne on the hands or feet. We still see this, especially when it comes into a dance section or maybe an ending position you're going to hit at the end of the routine. You Again, we're protecting the kids. We see injuries from this. So if you're going to a uh, split, you're going to the thighs, dropping on your knees or seats, again, you must bear weight in your hands. Again, it still happens and minor injuries and major injuries happen um, from a simple skill. And then falling from the standing position directly to stomach or back is not permitted. So I know you're going to see some creative choreography. Or you think this might be something that's cool. Again, be aware that those are not permitted there and there's some safety reasons for that. Um, a couple of things with props. Uh, there are no restrictions of height for chassa, so there might be some other restrictions. For other places, if you were to, to do that, but for chassa, the props, there's no uh, restrictions on the height of that. Jumps and or stunts are not permitted on props. So that's one we tend to call, especially in the game day where there's a lot of props out there. Be aware of that. Make sure you've practiced and know um, for safety reasons. So if uh, you're standing on a, uh, a prop, jumping on a prop, tumbling on a prop, stunting on a prop, anything like that, uh, make sure that you are aware that you're not doing that for safety. And then a base and a top person may share a palm. We've mentioned this multiple times to mount and dismount. Um, again, it's a very helpful thing and it's gonna make some of your lives easier as is ours. So if you have any questions or concerns, again, let us know. But um, I think that's kind of self-explanatory at this point. And then top person in a stunt or pyramid cannot release hard props to the ground. We touched on that, um, same thing comes through. Hard props, I think we kind of mentioned most of what the hard props are and to make sure we're safe. Um, some uh, examples of that, the corrugated plastic, you can see poster board signs, megaphones, poles, and uh, flags are a big thing. Couple of big ones, we talked about it, can't release throw or drop from a stunt, that one we touched on, but don't excessively throw. If it becomes a safety hazard and you're just launching that and it hits people in the front row or some- The judges. Yes, it, it's, it's a problem. So make sure it's not aggressive, make sure it's appropriate, not getting a lot of airborne on that. So make sure it's appropriate and not excessively thrown on there. And then um, can't give required uh, spotter uh, prop. We talked about that, especially in that extended position and then creating with them, okay? 
Um, there's a couple other ones just on the props as well. Make sure that uh, there's some ones if you ever wonder, can I use a flag in a, in a, in a stunt? The answer is no. So there's some other small ones tied into there as well. So if you're looking at props, um, adding those in there or if something that you haven't seen before, double check on it. Cool. Awesome. So now that pretty much completes everything that's in the Federation rule book as far as rules go that we are going to go through. The next piece that Brian's just going to touch base on is for those of you that are interested, and I just realized it still says 2021. So I need to change that date, but it is for 2022 for the game day information. Um, the game day information has not changed, which is why I did not update it to 2022 because the rules for the game day division haven't changed as we move into this year. We were super excited to see the level of participation in increase over the last couple of years into the game day division. Um, and it's been a great opportunity. If your team has never competed, this is a wonderful opportunity for them to be able to do, um, be able to show in competition exactly what they do every Friday night or at games um, and put it all together for a routine. So Brian's just gonna kind of hit down if you are considering doing game day or just having a fun performance for your school, this is what you need to know. Yep, and again, not too many changes here and it's under, it happens um, on that. But so a couple of things just to be aware of, um, again, if you are have been in the game day vision, you kind of got the feel of it. But again, anything you might have questions on, send us a video or with the new rule adjustments or there's anything that might apply to you, especially let us know. Um, but teams must uh, select a division at the time of registration. So when you sign up for state, again, this is for state only, how your leagues operate and how uh, some other companies competition, that's their rules or they have multiple divisions or allow you to do both. Um, again, you'll work that out here. But when you can uh, sign up to compete in states, um, you have to decide if you're gonna do the full traditional style routine or a game day routine. It's one or the other, you have to decide when you sign up. It's not like I can wait and change my mind later just because I saw this team or that team. No, that's how it goes. Your time limit is three minutes. Okay, that's key. There's no other rule besides the three minutes. I get a question all the time. Does each section have to be so long? Is it each section 30 seconds, 45? No, three minutes total. Make sure you're staying within that. The format of game day. Okay, it starts off with a band chant. You or, you or your coach will hit, or sorry, your coach will hit the music or that adult representative will hit the music, start the band chant. They go into the band chant. Then I'll be followed by a situational sideline where uh, the announcer will give you a cue and you'll have to uh, adjust to that. Uh, then into their crowd leading cheer, which just follows that. Uh, and then you find uh, your fight song, which again, you'll initiate the music for that. We'll go into a few details of what those involve. But the one thing that is good to be aware of, they must show clean separation between each section. Okay, now, how do you do that? Uh, the biggest thing that we look for and would call it on is that everybody comes down to the performance surface and is done. Um, where we tend to see it a lot is the sideline. People are in sidelines, they end in shoulder straddles and they go right into the cheer. Well, now that's overlapping. There's no distinction there because no one ever came down to the ground and said, showing us like, this is done. So make sure that's the clean distinction that you want. Again, for our game day here in Chassa, no tumbling is allowed. Again, different competitions from companies outside might have that. That's up to you and your, your decisions of what you go to and what divisions you're in. But for us, there is no tumbling. Um, so just keep that in mind. That's still there. And that's the answer is still, yeah, no tumbling. Um, mascots are allowed for game day only. Um, they must be included in the roster. So when you have a roster numbers, you're like, oh, I just want to throw in a mascot. Make sure it's applying to those. And again, there are some mascot rules in there. So remember that tumbling part of it and not being in full body costume and flipping or head over heels again, cartwheels and forward rolls are okay, but make sure your mascot's there and you're using them appropriately. I think that's the thing we see from judges a lot is that the mascot's serving a purpose, not just there um, to, to, to cause a distraction is what you wanna do. That also goes with props as well. I can tell you there was a lot of discussion. Um, when you are selecting props to use for game day, make sure that it is highlighting your um, highlighting your team. You don't have to use every prop that's allowed. As long as you are using whatever props you've selected, we certainly don't want teams to feel that they have to go purchase all new props or do everything so that they can be competitive in the division. Whatever props you choose to use, make sure that they're effective with leading the crowd and getting the excitement created for your particular routine. Correct. If they're distracted, too much from your routine that's just hurting yourself because that's again what you're being judged on all right let's talk about some of the formats on that so for the band chant that's what starts us off again um only kicks and jumps are allowed so again no tumbling uh squad should use spirit raising materials props again signs megs palms whatever makes sense 
and it's motivating, creative, and, and, and kind of getting your crowd going. So um, big thing to think of, and this is, helps you guys out, just so what should I have in that? Changes and ripples, um, execution of material, uh, shifts and changes front and back, all the good stuff. Um, but again, encouraging the crowd to participate. Um, and again, no stunts or tumbling in this section. You'll start and stop the music for that. Following that, the sideline, the announcer will announce a situational um, sideline situation. Um, again, they'll give you a cue, either offense or defense. Again, you want to call the correct one, so make sure you're paying attention. They should wait for the announcer to finish to make sure they get the full cue and then show the proper response um, for that. You can um, do some stunts in here, but again, main focus is should be crowd effectiveness, motion technique, and then skills that are relevant to the game day situation. If it's not something you would do on a sideline or during the game, um, it should be simple, easy, and again, the focus is leading the crowd, not just showing off and performing to them. So they're focused on you versus yelling with you. And I do believe it says stunts allowed. I do believe it's stunts required for what they want. Um, as far as for the judges on that score sheet, there is a part on the score sheet during that sideline for the incorporation piece that you add in, which includes the stunting element. So to set your team up to be successful, include stunting as part of yeah. your sideline. If you didn't do it, are you going to, you just won't get the points that you, you just won't get gotten. the points that you could have gotten. Yeah, so. so I guess required may be a strong word, but highly encouraged so yes. that you can really maximize the score sheet. Yes. So set your team up for success. If that's all you got, though, uh, just, just, just crush it. All right. And then the crowd leading cheer. Again, you want to show a solid distinction after the sideline. So it comes to the performance surface. And then make sure there's that clear separation. And then you're going to show off and show your spirited interaction uh, with the crowds. It should be crowd leading material. Um, make sure you are allowed to stunt, okay? Um, but make sure you're leading the crowd and include a cheer that's reflective of a timeout, a general sideline, a spell out, something the crowd can follow you with, yell with you. Um, and again, with the material, it helps them. So you can use the palm signs, megs, get the crowd to yell with you. Um, again, make it easy for them and then initiate a response from the crowd. You want them to, to again, participate um, as you're doing this. And then again, you can see some of those things to incorporate uh, spirit props, practical skills, and again, stunts are allowed and highly encouraged and um, are what's going to get you to score well on this. And again, just gives your, your cheer some different heights and it gets the crowd more involved. That's why we started stunting in the first place, to hit the people who couldn't see us. Yep. All right. And then you're going to finally finish that off with a fight song. The fight song is the final element. Again, you'll show that clear distinction come down fully from that cheer. Um, the fight song should incorporate crowd effective skills. Again, coaches or the adult representative will start and stop that music. Again, think of the different things, ripples, level changes, um, stunts can be in there. There's a little caveat to that, so I'll talk about that, but include the fun stuff, the spirit raising props, um, all the good stuff there. But let's talk about the incorp. There is an incorp that's allowed and you can stunt um, for that. It can be three consecutive eight counts of stunts. And I, we always forget this. Um, no tumbling okay so even it says and or tumbling again we cannot do tumbling if you go to other competitions other companies yes you can probably tumble in there but again for chassa there is no tumbling but three consecutive eight counts um the count begins right when you initiate the skill so if you're about to build into that that prep once you jump in that little dip that initiates it that's when we start counting our, our eight counts again three consecutive eight counts all right if the fight song repeats itself then the you are allowed to repeat that incorporation but it has to be the exact same incorporation that you did so let's put that one more time a little bit more simple when you were doing your fight song you have three eight counts to incorporate stunts if you choose to if you do that that'd be full three eight counts now if you do three eight counts and then you're in the air and it ends on that third eight counts and the music ends and you stop moving and you're done you're done if it's somewhere in the middle there you do three eight counts remember you're going up three you better be down by the end of three Ooh, ooh, alert there. We can redo that. Um, so if you do the eight counts, try in the middle, come down the 38 count, then you do it again, you can do the exact same eight counts, uh, same in corp, but it has to be the same three things that you did or three eight counts that you did. I don't know if I just confused you there. Three eight counts, make it the same. Um, one thing to be aware of that we tend to see, like we mentioned, it's three eight counts. If you go, oh, we got in, we're loading one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, two, 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 three, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, and then you think you're done, but then you add in a little go fight win or go big blue, and you're still in the air. If you're adding words or adding more skills, 
that's going above and beyond that eight count. Even though the music stops, we're still counting. So if you finish in the air and that's the end of it, you're done. You know, your spirit and coming down, great. But if you add on callbacks or add on letters or anything else, that is going to go above those three eight counts. Again, all that to be done within three minutes. If you have any questions or concerns, please let us know. We'd love to help you um, in answer any of those questions. That's why Liz and I do this. We're a service. Um, we we're, we give back to this uh, great activity and sport that has helped us out um, through the years. Absolutely. These are just some helpful resources for you as a coach. Obviously, the Chassa website is there for you. That's where you can locate the Spirit Bulletin. Um, you're going to want to make sure if you don't have that copy yet, you will want to read through that. It has information just on overall program, what's happening from Colorado, and then also talking about how to register for state and any changes and anything like that going on. Uh, so definitely pull out the Spirit Bulletin off the Chassa website if you've not done that yet. Another helpful resource is usacheer.org. That's where we've gotten a lot of the videos. They have helpful information. There's some tutorials and some other things uh, on that particular website. In addition to music information, um, music providers, all of that information is located on the usacheer.org website. So please check that one out as well. The nfhs.org uh, for Spirit, that is where they will have a digital copy of this too. So if you are tech savvy um, and love to not have to carry this book around, but want to be able to ex um, access it from your phone, as soon as it becomes available, we did check today and it was not yet uploaded, um, but that is where, that's the website where you'll be able to find that. As a reminder, these books should be arriving to your athletic director next week. So those should be available for you to pick up. And then obviously Brian and I, we always encourage you guys to send us videos. We want to be here to be helpful for you as you're prepping either for the safety of your season or getting ready for competition. You can submit cheer videos to us. I believe it's until mid-November. Um, please check the Spirit Bulletin. I want to say, I think it's November 15th um, off the top of my head. That's the deadline for turning in any skills that you would like for us to review prior to your season or prior to a game or anywhere you're wanting to perform those skills. We'd be happy to look at them. A couple things on sending in those videos. Please do not send us your entire competition routine. We only want to see the skills that you're doing and you only need to send either one stunt group that does it so that we can identify and be able to check grips, be able to check anything. If you make any changes to what you send to us in an original video, you need to resend it because making the slightest little change uh, to a skill or to a pyramid, moving somebody around um, as well may make that stunt legal or illegal. In addition, um, Brian's going to show you the correct way to videotape these. <laughs> Sideways. <laughs> um, make sure you guys are just, again, We I think you've had camera phones for a while now. Uh, just make sure you're doing them sideways. Look at it before you send it to us. We watch a lot of videos like sideways. this. Um, so make sure you're there. And then make sure you're giving us the section you want to see. Um, again, we don't want to see your whole routine. At the same time, we want to see how it started, how it ended, so we can advise that. Sometimes we see a quick little thing here. And there might have been a girl standing there like, wait, is that part of this? Is that something different? So make sure you're giving it clear um, and simple for it. So that we can give you a good solid um, feedback. Definitely. And as Brian said, please remove anybody that is not actively involved with the stunt or pyramid. Please take them out of the video just so that we can get a clear uh, picture as to who is actually involved in that stunt. If you have an extra person there, which isn't supposed to be uh, or that won't be there present on the day of competition, but we see them and we assume they're a spotter, uh, that could change the legality. And we're usually good about getting these back within a week, two weeks of its busy time. But if you haven't heard back from us, make sure you reach out to us again. There are things that sometimes they can go to a, a, a trash junk. folder or junk mm -hmm. folder. So make sure if you haven't heard back from us that you reach back out so that we're we're uh, catching everything that we can. And I think um, last year, which seemed to work well was send it to the Chassa cheer at chassa.org website for us for cheer. And then obviously the Chassa dance at chassa.org. Um, if you have any uh, dance, program related questions, but send that to us first. Then if you do not get a response, you can send it back to us, but also CC Jen on that email as well. Again, please do your part as a coach to ensure that your kids are set up to be successful. Um, a lot of times when it comes to league events or certain competitions, there may only be one tech judge. And you know what, we're human too. And we're watching, if you don't submit a video for us and we happen to miss something in a, at an event, um, obviously we do our very best to try to catch everything, but there could be something 
something else going on that takes our eye away at another part of the routine to where maybe somebody switches a grip, but we're looking in another direction and we didn't catch it at that particular event. And then it comes to state and we still haven't received a video from you. And we end up having to call it at that time. We never want that to happen. Again, we want your programs to be successful. We hate giving deductions. We don't want to give deductions. Our perfect season is everybody gets zero deductions. So please, please, please do your part by sending videos. And one other small thing on the videos, we do this every time. And I know we get it every year. If you know us, that is awesome, but still send it to Chassa Cheer. Because the minute you send it to me, I'm going to text you back. Send it to Chassa Cheer because this is official where it's going to go to. We won't give you a ruling if you try to text it to yes. Lizard myself. No rulings are given via text, <laughs> um, specifically as well as uh, talking in a conversation. Again, everybody, if you're trying to explain something to us in person or ask us a question over the phone, we can't physically see what's happening. We can't see where everybody's hands, um, where they're visually focused, all of that good stuff. So we do need the video to be sent. Um, but hopefully those will be some extra helpful resources yeah. for you. And then as always, Brian and I are always here to help as well. Um, as of right now, we have not been informed of any corrections in the book. So fingers crossed since we just got these fresh out of the box yeah. today. If we have any updates, we'll continue to keep you guys posted. But otherwise, we are finished with our yes. rules and meeting. all you veteran people we appreciate you sticking around and there are always some things you can pick up when you listen to these we appreciate all of it and again questions just let us know absolutely on behalf of brian and i we wish you guys the very best for a fun safe and successful season if we can be of any assistance to you at any time please don't hesitate to reach out to us at that chassis chair um email we'd be happy to get back in touch with you but best of luck and we look forward to seeing you this season thank you guys